Hey everyone, my name is Kevin from the University of Maryland. I want to first give a huge shout out to all the Folkway organizers for making this event possible, despite everything that's been going on this past year. Now today I'm gonna to be talking about a backup censorship system that we discovered currently operational in China. But before I get into that, I wanted to start with a run through how China's primary HTTPS censorship works. Now China has a highly sophisticated censorship system and it censors more than just HTTPS, but that's gonna be the focus for today. Now for HTTPS specifically, I wanna note that we have discovered in the past that China does have two separate middle box systems working in concert to perform censorship. One to censor connections via the server name indication field, SNI, and one to censor ESNI. Now the focus of today's talk specifically is on their SNI based censorship middle boxes. So for the rest of this talk, when I say HTTPS censorship, what I mean is SNI based censorship. Now this SNI censorship system has a few known properties. It censors by looking for the server name indication field. It tears down the connection immediately upon seeing this. It does this tear down by injecting three reset act packets. And if for some reason the sensor fails, the connection will still succeed. So let's see what this looks like. If the client generates a TLS client hello to some forbidden resource, let's say wikipedia.org, and this passes through the, this will pass through the SNI sensor. This will perform deep packet inspection or DPI, and the packet will pass through. The sense, however, immediately generates three reset act packets and sends those both to the client and the server to such on the connection. Now, around September of 2019, we were studying China's HTTPS censorship, and we were trying to reproduce our results from prior paper. We were noticing some strange things. Instead of getting censored immediately after sending the TLS client hello containing the forbidden SNI, we would see cases of teardowns happening deeper in the TLS handshake, well after the SNI packet. And instead of seeing three reset act packets, we only saw one single reset packet. And in cases when we didn't see any reset act packets at all, the connection was still getting torn down. At the time, we didn't know what to make of this, but since we've improved our tooling and we've done additional experiments, what we believe we've discovered is that China has deployed a second backup censorship system. This secondary sensory middle box tears down connections with a single reset packet. It doesn't act until deeper in the TLS handshake. And most interestingly, it does not act if the primary does. And this is actually why we believe that the system went undetected for so long by researchers. Together, this composes with the existing SNI censorship to create stronger censorship in depth. Now, before I continue, I do want to contextualize this and make it clear that our measurements, just like all censorship research, are limited by the vantage points we have access to. We did all these experiments with two vantage points located in different ISPs. So it's possible there's further variation in other geographic, geographic locations. So if there's anyone in the audience that has a broader reach into China and wants to look at this more with us, please don't hesitate to reach out after the talk. Let's walk through where these sensors operate. Consider the start of a normal HTTPS connection. We first start with a TCP through a handshake. So we have our SYN, followed by our SYNAC, followed by our ACT. Now once complete, the client's gonna start the TLS handshake and it's gonna generate a TLS client hello. And this is the packet that contains the server name indication field. This is the forbidden value. So in our prior example, it would have the plain text string wikipedia.org. It's at this point in the connection that the primary middle box steps in and injects three reset act packets, and it tries to tear down the connection immediately. But let's explore the failure case. Let's see if for some reason it doesn't inject packets, something goes wrong. In this case, the TLS handshake would continue. The server would send a server hello, the client would send a client key exchange among some other things. And it's at this point now that the secondary system steps in and injects one reset packet in both directions. And this is actually why I'm referring to this backup system as a backup, because it only acts after the existing, the existing system does not. So what's most interesting about these two middle boxes is there seems to be some crude interaction between them. So specifically, when the primary middle box injects three reset act packets, the backup will ignore the rest of the connection, even if those reset act packets fail to tear down the connection. So said another way, if the primary takes action, regardless of the result of that action, prevents the backup from taking any action at all. Now this seriously complicates our ability to study the backup. All of our test connections and experiments are just gonna be processed by the primary, which will promptly shut down the backup. So what can we do to study the backup censorship middle box in isolation? Our solution for this is to manipulate the packet stream in such a way that we can disable the primary without affecting the backup middle box. And once we have this ability, what we can do is we can shut down the primary for our connections, and then study and perform measurements of the backup middle box in isolation. And that's what we do in this work. So for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna split this into two halves. I'm first gonna talk about how we can disable the primary without disabling the backup to isolate it, and also how we can defeat both simultaneously. And we do this with packet manipulation strategies. 
Once we have the ability to disable the primary, I'm gonna to speak to how the backup works specifically and how it compares to the primary. And we'll see these middle boxes are by and large pretty similar. So first let's talk about evasion. Now we could try and evade both of these and find a packet sequences that defeats them both. And we actually did do this in the paper. We found ways that we could defeat both of these censorship systems. And as of right now, anyone can take those strategies, use our open source tooling and defeat the HTTPS censorship from the client and evade censorship. But we wanted to take this a step further because we wanted to be able to study and probe the backup middle box in isolation. So to do this, we wanna find a way to disable the primary without disabling the backup middle box. To do this, we used a, cool, a tool called Geneva, which stands for genetic evasion. Geneva is a genetic algorithm that we developed in the past that discovers ways to manipulate an existing packet stream from only one side of the connection to evade censorship. We first developed Geneva back in 2019 and have since used it to evade censorship in many countries. Now for this work specifically, we modified one of Geneva's fitness functions to ignore the effects of the backup and tailored its training so it would exclusively be looking at the primary. And this allows us to find censorship strategies that defeat the primary without evading the backup. And I'd love to show you some of the strategies that Geneva found to disable one or both of these middle boxes. The first of these strategies is called double SIN segmentation. So here our client is about to start a new connection and it's about to send its SIN packet. Before it goes, we're gonna take that SIN packet and duplicate it. We're gonna send two SIN packets out. Next, when the client goes to generate its TLS client hello, we capture that client hello, we segment it and send those out of order. We send the second half first and then the first half. And it's this combination of sending two SIN packets followed by an out of order segmentation of the TLS client hello, that's enough to disable the primary middle box with 100% reliability while having no effect on the backup middle box. Now what's interesting is if you change any aspect of the strategy, if you only send one SIN packet or if you send the segments back in order, the strategy no longer works. What's also odd about this strategy is that the Great Firewall has been known to be able to reassemble TCP segments since at least 2012. Now researchers, including us in the past, have found bugs in the segmentation reassembly. But we've never seen anything that looks like this, where the du duplicate packets in the three-way handshake has an effect on its ability to reassemble segments. In the next strategy I'll show you, we'll see even stranger effects of segmentation. We call this strategy segmentation overload, and it works purely by performing TCP segmentation of the TLS client hello. So please consider this crude blue rectangle as the bytes of the outbound TLS client hello packet. Geneva discovered that it could segment this request into seven segments, and if it rearranged them in just the right way, it could bypass the primary censorship middle box. Now I want to note that this rainbow of colors you're seeing here is completely arbitrary. I've just added these colors so that when I move these boxes around and you can see the segment ordering, you can see the segment ordering effects of the strategy. I also wanna know the gray box you're seeing in this diagram is the position of the packet of the SNI field, so wikipedia.org. Here's the segments after they've be, been rearranged. We arrange these like this. This disables the primary with 100% reliability without affecting the backup middle box. And Geneva found actually dozens of segment orderings that have this property of defeating the primary without defeating the backup. I also wanna point out that this SNI field is not split across multiple segments. It remains intact in plain text in one segment towards the front. What's strange about this strategy is that small changes to it can have a big impact. For example, Geneva discovered that if we change the order of these two segments here, this green and yellow guy, the strategy now defeats both middle boxes with 100% reliability. At the same time though, if we reverse the order of these orange and red segments back here, now the strategy defeats neither. We've examined over hundred instances of these segmentation order strategies. And we don't have a great understanding of why they work. If you're interested in the paper, we present more details on these, including a simpler version of the strategies Geneva found, but frankly, we still do not know why these work. In the paper, we also detail other strategies we found and their effects on both middle boxes. Now, these include other interesting interactions with the through a handshake, and additional strange segmentation-based strategies. Now that we have the ability to disable the primary middle box and study the backup in isolation, we can start learning more about how the backup works. One of the first things we did was we wanted to test the reliability of the primary and backup middle boxes. In the past, researchers, including us, had measured the reliability of the SNI censorship middle boxes at about 97 to 98%. We were curious if this secondary censorship middle box we were seeing had any effect on this. We generated a large number of test connections targeted towards each middle box in isolation. Now, what we found was that individually, the reliabilities were lower, 
but the composition of their success rate very closely matched the previously measured values. And this is a cool result. And this suggests that this value we've been measuring in the past is not just one middle box, but multiple actually running quietly in concert. There are also more details in the paper that unfortunately we just don't have time to go into today. Uh, more mechanics about how the backup works and how it compares to the primary. Uh, we examined which ports it monitors and found it measures, it monitors all ports basically. Uh, we checked that they have different block lists, which they appear to share the same one. Uh, we found that the backup operates bidirectionally, which is good because this is easier for researchers to study. And we looked into what packets trigger the backup. And we found it actually only fires if it sees a client key exchange or a client change cipher spec message. And there's other details as well in the paper. Now, before I conclude, I wanted to end with a quick discussion on why we should bother studying SNI-based censorship. Because TLS, the standard is continuing to advance and it's continued to advance in a way that hopefully the SNI field is becoming obsolete. Uh, there's encrypted SNI or ESNI in TLS 1.3. This is already rolled out and on the market. And there's also encrypted client hello coming soon or ECH. And both of these new features promise to eliminate the SNI field as we know it today. Unfortunately, there's no guarantee that these new privacy preserving features will ever be available within censoring regimes. Uh, for example, just last year, China took the drastic step to block all use of ESNI in the country and basically stop the rollout of ESNI dead in its tracks within China. So unfortunately, as the protocol continues to advance, there's no guarantee that these advancements will be accessible to those people who need them most. And for that reason, we believe it's important to continue studying SNI-based censorships. That's all the time I have for today. I wanna to thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. I will note that all of our code we use for this is up on our website at geneva.cs.umd.edu. Thanks so much.